This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Welcome to another episode of the School Success Podcast. We got a good one for you today. I'm joined by a new friend out of Sparta, New Jersey. His name is Thomas Argensinger, and he is the head of school at Veritas Christian Academy there in, of course, Sparta, New Jersey. They're doing some cool things. He's a great guy who has lived in Florida a little bit. We've been able to talk in before the actual recording, get to know each other a little bit. And I just love him and love his heart and what he's doing. So I was like, we got to have this guy on the podcast to hear what is he doing at his school and how are things going. So I don't want to take any thunder away from this man. So I will pass it off to him to introduce himself. So Thomas, welcome to the podcast today, sir. Thank you, Mitchell. It's a pleasure to be here. It's going to be fun. And I always start off the podcast with asking if I was to come visit you in New Jersey, in Sparta, New Jersey, or wherever you're at, what would we do for fun? What's the thing that you're like, you got to do this when you're here? Two words, Mitchell, bagels and diners, bagels and diners. We have some of the best bagel shops I have ever seen, ever been to. And we also have like a ton of diners. We don't have a lot of like other kind of restaurants, but we have a ton of diners and many of this like old school American type food. And if you're looking for that kind of stuff, we got it in spades. Boom. All right. I love me some bagels. And so there you go. what's the go-to topping in New Jersey for a bagel? Is it just cream cheese, butter? What is it? Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, this is, this is a big deal. So they got Bialis here. Bialy. You ever had a Bialy bagel? I have not. Oh, come on now. Bialis had, they scoop out the top piece of the bagel and they put like garlic and all sorts of spicy kind of things in there. So it's kind of savory. And then they put in, you could put lox in there, like those cream cheese with fish in it. And you can put all kinds of things. So it's a thing. I mean, you got to try that. Bialy cream cheese is good too. But all, overall, it's Bialy's, uh, I love them. Now, they, what do they do with the part of the bagel that they scoop out? They don't throw it away, do they? I think they sell it on eBay. I don't know. What, I don't really, I have no idea what they do with it, to tell you the truth. Man, they call that, that they call that something. What do they call that? The bagel scoop. Is it just called scooped? Like if you just get a bagel. Yeah, yeah that's right. You can get, but it's scooped out. That's scooped out on the other side of it. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> that's so funny. All right, sign me up. I will try that. I'll okay. Go to- All right. Good deal. So I love a quick background on you. Of course, I know a little bit of your background talking with you and being connected on LinkedIn. But for those listening, to get a kind of a backstory of how Thomas got to where he is today, let's hear how you got there. Yeah, well, in a nutshell, I was really called to this. I mean, I think anybody who does this for as long as I have, which is now in my, I'm in my 41st year in wow. education, about the first seven years were public school, served some time on a church staff, but that was also a lot of church education, religious education, if you will. And then the last 30 plus, almost 38 years has really been on, well, about 35 years has been on in Christian ed. And so that journey has been really interesting because I've seen a ton of trends come and go. And I've also seen a lot of changes in the, in the profession as well. Grew up in New York state near the Adirondack park, lived in Florida for over 30 years, worked there, got called to New York city, worked there uh, up till around the pandemic time. And then we ended up coming over here to New Jersey. Man, quick. I love it. And I'm assuming you love New Jersey. I'm assuming. Yeah, New Jersey is a really interesting place, you know, because it's beautiful where we are. It's kind of a rural area in Sussex County. So it's a beautiful topographically. The folks are nice here. Uh, There's a lot of opportunities here to grow Christian education and just to provide some educational opportunities that might not be available in some other ways. And so it's actually a great place to be practicing. I love it. And to kind of dive into your school, let's, before we dive into kind of the first questions, let's share a little bit bit about your school in general, how long it's been there and the size and all that stuff of it. Yeah. We're a small high school, nine through 12, run about a little bit under 50 kids. Uh, There was a time in the past when the school was a little larger, but there's been some demographic changes in the area, et cetera. And we've kind of 
over the last couple of years sort of hit bottom and are on the way back up again. So we're really grateful for that. We've been around for about, I think this is our 16th year of operation here in Sparta. And so, yeah, so there are also two K-8 Christian schools here and they act as sort of feeders for our school. But our school is a pretty much, believe it or not, for such a small school, it's a pretty full service school. We have a lot of offerings. We actually have championship sports teams. Our girls basketball team won the national championship last year, which is really remarkable, again, given the size. We also have, have some really unique programs as well. So yeah, we're really blessed to be here. Incredible. And you guys have your own building. You guys rent from a church. What's the, that look like? Yeah, the B choice. We rent from a church, at least from a church, and we have a great relationship with them. And we're so grateful for what they've done over the years. Actually, that we've been renting since the school's inception. And so they're very gracious in that because they're growing gangbusters, this particular church, Sparta E Free Church. And so they're gracious to allow us to continue here. But we are actively looking for another home as much as we love it here in order for us to really actualize the vision that we've been given by the Lord. We're going to need our own space. I think that's the perfect transition. And to just talk about some challenges, that sounds like one right there. But what are some of these challenges for you guys as a school you're facing right now? And not just Mm -hmm. here's the challenge, but I'd love to hear how you guys are currently combating those challenges or planning on combating those challenges. Yeah, that's great. There's a couple, I mean, we suffer from all, as I've listened to some of your podcasts in the past, you know, everybody kind of has similar challenges. You know, staffing is a really tough nut these days. We were very blessed this year because we got some great new people. We actually have all of our spaces filled with not just people, but quality faculty. And we consider that an incredible. So that is a challenge, certainly facilities and Visibility, because one of the the more subtle aspects of having your own building is that you're more visible to the community. And that, believe it or not, is a really important thing. And so our own facility is really an issue for us, for sure. Also, just helping people understand who we really are, the issue of marketing, and you might even say branding in some ways, you know, how, how can we really show the distinctives of what we do? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we do charge for our education and people can go down the road and get it for free. And so that's a unique business challenge, you know, along the way. But the other thing that makes this school, I think, really, you know, challenging is we're also challenging cultural narratives. You know, a lot of the ways culture is looking at certain things, certain hot button issues are basically a field from what maybe the Bible teaches about that particular cultural issue. And so as we hold true to our standard of truth, which is the word of God, then that just naturally kind of creates a distance that is that we have to deal with that distance and we have to love people through that distance, if you will. And I think that's a unique challenge for schools that are faith-based. I love it. And you mentioned, so if you have 50 something students, have you guys seen the, at all, like more calls and an influx from just what's going on in our country right now? I know that there's a lot of Christian schools that have been getting a lot of people interested mm-hmm. into their school, especially I know when masks were a thing, we're going like, Hey, they're not requiring it. So I'm going to go to this school. Have you guys seen any of that coming into play with people coming to your school? Yes, I think so. We've seen an increase of somewhere around 10 to 15 percent, which is about average, I've found out, for our kind of school throughout the nation. So we're pretty much right at that average rate of growth, which we're very grateful for. I would say most of our people now are really, they're either coming from the community or homeschooling, or they're coming from, as in, in that second part of what you said, where they're coming by saying, you know, look, the cultural narratives, we're not quite on board with all that. And we're looking for an alternative. So that's that's where a, a lot of our people are coming, as well as an increasing number, actually, from just the general community. Okay. And I sometimes throw every once in a while a curveball to people. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to hear, I don't know if this is a challenge maybe you guys are up against or not, but the fundraising side. Every once in a while, I want to just mention that. If like, if there is there any <laughs> things you guys have done in the past? I know you and I have talked about fundraising a little bit, but any ones that you've done in the past, you're like, hey, this was really successful for our school that you wouldn't mind sharing if there is any. If there's not, no worries, but just seeing if there's other ideas out there for fundraising. Yeah, that's a great point. We do have to fundraise quite a bit of money every year. Most of our fundraisers are fairly traditional. One of the ones we're trying this year, that's a new one, we're actually cooperating with our 2K8 sister schools. And we're essentially cooperating in, I forget the, what the exact name they called it, but what, essentially what it boils down to is that the school gives the students who want to participate 
a hundred bucks or a set amount of money. And they basically say, take this hundred bucks and go make money. So it's basically like an entrepreneurial thing. And so they brainstorm with their parents or other kids and they maybe come together and in a collaborative grouping or whatever it might be. And they figure out ways they can create a product with that basic hundred dollar investment and then they sell that product. And then there's a deal formula that we use in order to say, okay, well, the school's going to get so much of this, et cetera, et cetera. But that's kind of a unique one that I hadn't really heard of until I got here. And that's been very interesting to see because it com combines a real educational value that we have, which is preparing kids for that kind of a life. A lot of our constituency are small business owners. That's a, that's a large part of our constituency. And so this seems like a natural fit, at least for us. And so far, the returns, it actually goes on for quite a few months, but the returns so far have been very good. I love that one. I haven't that even heard that. I, so obviously, being in business myself, I, just, I would have eaten that up as a kid. Now, I was mm -hmm. old my entire life, but my mom gave me you know, the permission or the freedom to kind of do mm -hmm. whatever I wanted. So, man, when I was a little kid, I sold lemonade. I was one of the like, legit. I sold you were lemonade. that guy. That's I was that kid. I remember one day, this is a shout out to UPS. They didn't sponsor this episode, but I guess they should have. But they, I remember I was probably five, six years old down at the end of the road selling lemonade. And it was four for a dollar, you know, four cups of lemonade for a dollar. I remember using country time lemonade powder, super cheap stuff, you know. And I'm down there, this UPS guy comes by and uh, he stops and he gives me a dollar. And I go, wow, you want four lemonades? And he goes, no, man, I don't <laughs> want anything. You keep it. And oh, I was wow. like, I remember looking down to the dollar going, oh my gosh, I am rich. And he left, he didn't take a lemonade. And I just never forgot. I was like, UPS, man, that's a great shipping company right there. So uh, awesome. money was a huge motivator for me as a kid. And it really got me thinking like, this is how the world functions and works. So that is something I can really get behind. I'd love to hear Thomas, like later, what you, kind of what your findings were from that as you guys sure. do that. Just for me to pitch that to some other schools as an idea, I've not yet heard that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love it. I mean going a step further, like my son just turned three and I'm starting like the, uh, I like using the word allowance. You know, if you're a Dave Ramsey person, of course, he doesn't like the word allowance. He likes the right. word, and you know, so we're doing, we're just starting out with him as three years old. And just this week I was uh, reading him the books. There's like these children's books about money. And I heard him come home the other day and he, I heard him yell to his mom. He goes, mom, I got to find my money books. And he wanted <laughs> to books. So like, he's already trying to, I'm trying to get him to grasp like, Hey, money you need money to buy a toy you need money to buy food and stuff so it, i was i just smiled i was on a call and i was smiling going my son's wanting to learn about money and I, that's cool so like to prepare these kids for something like that where it's hey if you fail it's it's like okay like it's not like we're going to go destitute with the, the school lost a hundred dollars or whatever but it gives right. them the opportunity to fail or to try something on their own i love it oh that's mm -hmm. so cool mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you got to keep me posted on that one. Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad to follow up on that. And just to be clear, it wasn't my idea. It was actually a parent's idea. I think it was fabulous. But other schools are doing it, or this was just, like, truly from her? Yeah, it really came from a parent who had done it in one of the actual, one of the feeder schools, and they had a lot of success. And she said, well, hey, why not do it here, and we can do it with all three schools? Because we're looking for, we're increasingly looking for ways to collaborate and cooperate. And I thought, this is awesome. I think this is, it, it is unique and it does fit with what we're trying to do. So yeah, let's go for it. Oh, so cool. So cool. Well, that's also a perfect segue into the next section. Just talking about what's going really good. Give you a chance mm -hmm. to brag about your school. Mm -hmm. I'd love to just share kind of anything that pops in your mind. Cause this is where I want those that are listening to be hearing from other schools of what's going really good to maybe give them some ideas they can take back to their school. Yeah, absolutely. Again, we're blessed in so many ways, Mitchell. One of the ways I think that we've really grown a lot, this is my third year at Veritas, and one of the ways I think we've grown a lot is in the area of culture. Culture these days, I think, is harder than ever to build, and it's even harder to maintain mm -hmm. because there are so much, there's so many influences and they're so impactful in kids' lives way beyond what we do here or what might happen even at home or even in churches. So it's very complex. But one of the things we found is that in the building of a culture that's growing, in a sense, becoming better, if you will, of becoming more open, more what we call shalom community. We have a vision for building a shalom community of peace, safety, wholeness, and hope. And so the first thing we try to do coming in was set a vision for that. Say, this is normal. This is normal life. First of all, it's normal life in the kingdom of God, but really it's a normal life, just people getting along. 
and realizing that's the way it's supposed to be. And then on, underneath that, or on top of that, we layered policies. Because at the end of the day, you know, you tend to get what you inspect, not as much what you expect. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we did have policies and we kind of tweaked a lot of our policies as far as our behavioral things as to how we can continue to reinforce, you know, that standard. And I think the third way that has, and probably the most impacting thing has been that when we talk to the students about Shalom community, we tell them it's not really so much just about building a better community here at Veritas. I mean, it is that. But it's really about beyond that, because at the end of the day, we want to be able to move into culture and actually have a positive effect, a positive impact. We want to give ourselves away, in a sense, to whatever calling God has for our lives. And if we understand that shalom dynamic, that, that wholeness and the idea of peace and safety and hope, that frankly is in short supply. All of those things are in short supply. So we say, look, it's not just about here. It's about out there, too. And we're increasingly building partnerships in the community and getting the kids out into the community to realize there's a bigger world out there. And we have the opportunity, a fantastic opportunity to do that. So I would say, in short, on the culture side, I think those are three things that we're doing to try to move that forward. I love it. I love it. You mentioned culture and that's come up a few times with some guests that we've had on and I agree with you. It's so incredibly important and it can be ruined really easily and really quickly. Yep. It's like the wrong students or the wrong staff get into the school. Very have, true. You, have you seen the culture shift in the three years you've been there? Was it a certain way and you came in and kind of said, whoa, there's no culture, there's not there's bad culture and you've had to shift it. How has that kind of like played out? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was bad. I mean, I think the, of my previous my predecessors had done, had done a great job, you know, in a lot of ways. But I think what we've been able to do is to plug into some of the changes and trends that are happening maybe a little bit more. And that allows us to increase our awareness and to be able to, in a sense, analyze our culture a little bit more deeply. And that's really, I think, what's been really helpful. So it wasn't so much that nothing was being done before. It's just that we're seeing more of what needs to be done, I think, and then we're developing strategies with our accreditation organizations help and in cooperation with other my peers, et cetera, finding ways to really improve this because it is crucial. I mean, in a way it's centrally crucial. Mm. What have you done specifically with these students? Like, okay, you got say 50 easy math they're coming in. How are you instilling this culture in them to have them bring that into the school and be a contributor, not a contractor with like, with yeah, it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, out. Well, I think it starts from our first chapel of the year because we actually have an honor code here and we everybody recites that honor code in unison. And that's just part of being a lion at Veritas, you know. And so we start with those kind of more ceremonial things because I know I'm old school and I'm not getting any younger, but I still believe that ceremony has a place. I still believe that rehearsing those things as a community matters. And so you because you can refer back to it. And I think that's strong. Again, I think the concept of setting that shalom vision with our faculty and staff and using that as a part of our training and in onboarding for our new folks, et cetera, is crucial, especially this year when we had a lot of new folks coming in. We also try to set up out of school events that get our faculty and staff alongside the kids. We reinstated a retreat this year that had been out because of COVID called it Lion Camp and spent a couple of days out in Pennsylvania. And it was fantastic because at the end of the day, the culture is I think more caught than taught. You can set the standards, you can do the ceremony or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's that walking alongside day after day after day and modeling. And really, frankly, having high expectations of the young people that are here saying, you know, we don't want to set the bar way down here because that's what you'll attain to if that's where the bar is set. So you have to be bold, fair and consistent, firm, fair and consistent as you do it, but set the bar at a place that is attainable but is a stretch for some folks. And, and we've seen some real fruit from that so far. Yeah, because if you don't set the bar, then they, where are they going? How are they going to get there? What's the judgment or the, the ruler that they're using to measure it? How are you measuring yeah, it? So 100%. That's really good. Do you guys as a school have like a mission statement vision that you've created that you say, hey, hey students, this is who we are as a school that you are a part of? Do you guys have that in place? We do, and the way that we have it all written down, of course, but the way we sort of summarize it is, at Veritas, we rise higher. The expectation is that 
first of all, as followers of Christ, we should be setting the standards in the sense of excellence, not following behind. Secondly, there's a world that is in a lot of trouble in many ways. And anything that we can do and inspire students and train students to get out into the actual world, the real world, and make a significant impact or even a tiny impact, whatever it may be, through the way they raise their family, through the jobs they get, and through the careers that they're called to, the vocations they're called to. At the end of the day, that's a privilege. And so I think also, again, trying to get them to make that transference, especially our seniors, to make that transference into the real world. Many of our, a decreasing number of our kids, and this is true across the board in schools, are attending college. More kids are getting into the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. We still have quite a few kids who do, but, and so it isn't just about going to college, it's about living, you know, having a real life in the real world. And what does that look like as a follower of Christ and just as a good human being? So true, so good. Well, I know you've been in education for a long time. Not calling out your age. I think you're 34, 35, I think you said. Oh yeah, times two. Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's looking good. good, man, you're looking good. <laughs> yeah. Just to kind of look to wrap up the episode, I always want to pass it off to our guests to share what would be a piece of advice that you'd like to share with the school leaders that are listening? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I would say choose your standards carefully. Mm. What is your standard for doing what you're doing? And how does that standard that helps you make decisions connect to the vision that you've been given? I think that a lot of times what I'm seeing today is that we're not quite sure what the standards are we're supposed to be attaining to or connecting to. And therefore our vision doesn't have a root. And it doesn't, it just is kind of like floating out here in the ether somewhere. So I would say, consider carefully what standards you're using to make decisions and strategy, and then connect that very carefully to the vision that you have for your enterprise. Ooh, so I'm gonna pick it apart a little bit in a good Go way. For it. I love that. So where, if somebody's listening and they go, okay, I want to do that. Where would you say they should start to get that standard? Like where should they read a certain book? Should they listen to some po different podcasts? Like where would they get that standard to start from? They definitely should listen to the Better Schools podcast. First of all, let me just say that, okay? Shameless plug. But I think, you know, the way I always answer that question is, you know, obviously as a follower of Christ, I'm going to say there's a lot in the Bible that's really helpful as far as principles in order to move forward on this. And so the timeless truth, values, and virtues that are found in scripture are central to me, to us as believers. But in general, I think there's so many other things that are out there that are positive, you know, and I think that are engaging. So part of it is choosing a standard, whether it's best practices, you know, standard operating procedures that have, people have found to be very successful. Like for example, the basic idea of turning outward and not inward. That's really important for schools and I personally feel businesses as well. You know, it is about us doing well but it's really almost more about the community we are in doing well. And so one of those standards, I think that we can probably almost all agree on, regardless of our perspective on faith, is we wanna make a positive difference in our community right now, not just when the kids graduate, but while they're in school, how can we do that? So that's one way to look at it anyway. Okay, that's perfect. I love it. Thanks for letting me give you a right hook. I love throwing in some little right hooks and getting you some, getting you thinking about it. Oh, so, good. And Thomas, it's been awesome. Been great knowing you, getting to interview you and hear from you and learn from you. Uh, I love what you guys are doing up there in New Jersey. And I love that they have you there leading them. So wishing you guys nothing but the best as you guys continue to grow and to educate that next generation that's coming up through your school and behind them and all that. So keep doing what you're doing, man. You're doing awesome. Thanks so much, Mitchell. Thanks for having me on. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Thomas for taking time and being on the podcast today. I love what he's doing with his Christian school up there in New Jersey and wishing them nothing but the best as they continue to grow and educate the next generation that's coming behind us. And if you're a school leader that's listening to this, I'm hoping you can take at least one thing from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. And if you're one of these schools listening and you have open seats at your school currently and you have room to grow, you're obviously leaving revenue on the table as a school because if you're not filling those seats, those that could be more dollars coming in from people who 
are out there that need to attend a school or might want to attend your school. And that's what we specialize in. With my company, we love helping schools grow. We love helping them to automate the application and enrollment process. So we take that off your plate so you don't have to worry about it anymore. And you can check us out online, which is schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. Or if you'd rather just kind of get connected with, with myself and some other people that are in our private Facebook group, we'd love you to join that as well. It's School Success Makers on Facebook, private group just for school leaders, School Success Makers. I'd love to personally see you in there. We will be here next time with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.